Hello and welcome to the Storytelling with Puck podcast. We will, as always, start with a story. T.E. Lawrence said, all men dream, but not equally. Those who dream by night in the dusty recesses of their mind wake in the day to find that it was vanity. But the dreamers of the day are dangerous men for they may act on their dreams with open eyes to make them possible. My personal story. It was at Cardiff Millennium Stadium that my love affair with Madonna hit the rocks. I'd been a material girl desperately seeking something and the soundtrack to my life until that night in 2008 had been provided mostly by Madge. Sadly, she stepped out on stage late, gave a lacklustre 45 minute performance, only connected with the audience at La Isla Bonita, and then without an encore, left. My adoration had left with her. Perhaps I was growing old or growing up, but I was fed up. She'd sung hung up and I'd momentarily felt a bit better. I left feeling betrayed, yet the lyrics to her song, Nobody Knows Me, would not stop playing in my head on repeat. The words, I've had so many lives since I was a child and I realize how many times I've died. Nobody, nobody knows me. Nobody knows me. That is how I felt in my life misunderstood lonely like I kept living the wrong life and was an actress in a play I'd actually not realized I'd auditioned for. This pattern had been playing out for longer than I could remember. The most intense period of my life changing took place over an 18 month period between 2003 and 2005. My life imploded, stripping away almost everything I knew, cherished, connected to and identified with. I went from a seemingly healthy and attractive 40 something who'd made a million from her amazing PR career, living in a beachfront house in the Bahamas to a single jobless mother in a rented house in England having cancer treatment and supporting my depressed father after burying my mother. This was my first major wake up call to let go of what had gone before and reset my life for living at a higher level. I'd thought I'd nailed it then, as the time I spent on the cancer journey was one of the most uplifting of my life, yet it didn't hold. The true transformation took a while longer. On the outside, I put the illness and losses behind me and it looked okay. I found a new and wonderful work. I bought a house. I made new friends. I remarried. I rebuilt a life. Yet, as I sat alone in that Cardiff Millennium Stadium in Wales, watching Madonna, the pain overwhelmed me. And I I knew I could no longer pretend to be happy, whole or at one with myself. I had many mantras going through my head, things that had righted me in the past. I'm a weeble, I wobble, but I don't fall down. That was the advertising slogan in the 70s of the weeble toys, which had weighted bottoms to keep them from falling over when rocked. The trouble is that for most of my life, I'd look like I'd bounce, I would bounce back and I would even do so temporarily. But it was taking a huge internal, emotional and physical toll. Never more did I need the array of fixes to keep me from falling than when I ran my PR company in the 90s. Negative things such as alcohol, anger, sleeping tablets or allowing my subconscious to take charge of my appearance and keep my body a size zero via bulimia. On a positive side, good things such as acupuncture, massage, Ayurvedic medicine, 
psychotherapy, hypnotherapy, colonics, kinesiology, flotation tank therapy, and more kept me going. But all the latter were just like plasters holding me together. The former often just numbed the pain. I'd launched my PR company with a 5,000 redundancy package in my spare room with my basset hound Rosie as my first member of staff. Three years later, its turnover was £250,000 and we were getting noticed. We had great staff, nice officers, and we were winning pretty much everything we pitched for, yet I was miserable. It all felt so burdensome. At night, I couldn't sleep. I felt like I had to keep spinning plates on poles. I was handling the UK PR for arguably the world's greatest motivational guru, Tony Robbins, and going through his premier live course, Mastery University. I was learning all about my internal dialogue. I was digging deep for my values. I was tapping into my inner power. I then went on to represent Brandon Bayes and Robin, Robert Holden and Edward de Bono. So I embraced their teachings to heal many past wounds and develop a deeper understanding of myself. I even felt happy some of the time. For years, I tried without success to get pregnant. I tried every complementary therapy and medical procedure, apart from the IVF I was offered, because by then I was so fed up with it. I didn't want the process anymore. What I didn't realize at the time were two things. Firstly, my mind was saying to my body, are you crazy? You can barely get through your 12-hour day fueled by adrenaline and coffee. You don't sleep at night due to worry. And you want to grow a healthy baby in this environment. You even want to time the birth so you can be back at work within 48 hours. No deal. Secondly, my immune and hormonal system was highly compromised, having been depleted through years of taking antibiotics as a child to counter early and nearly dying of whooping cough and German measles when I was 18 months old. So I thought it was normal to have constant tonsillitis, an emergency tonsillectomy at 26, repeated glandular fever, no period, psoriasis, IBS, shingles, as I arrived in my 30s. This compromised health came back to haunt me in the Bahamas. The PR company had soared up to over a million pounds and we were winning a string of awards. We'd been bought out. I thought I'd dodged a bullet by getting out of the rat race alive. I was a vegan. My size zero body was honed to perfection as I ran five kilometers every morning before the gym. And then I started to feel run down. I thought it was flu. I found a lump in my breast following a mammogram that had said I was fine. I thought it was a cyst. My diagnosis came the day before Good Friday. I was 43 years old. Given the type of breast cancer, invasive lobular carcinoma, and having young children, I chose to go to the Moffitt Cancer Clinic in Tampa, Florida, not just because of its outstanding reputation, but because it was an independent clinic. And I felt that some of the other hospitals were in the pocket of Big Pharma and were bound to suggest a very oncological course of treatment. Three weeks later, just before I was on the operating table, something spiritual and amazing happened. But perhaps more of that later. What happened in terms of my life is that following a chance conversation at a party shortly before the cancer treatment, we discovered a 10 acre farm on an out island in Eleuthera, which means freedom in Greek, in the Bahamas was available. It had been mothballed. What better place to recover from my treatment than an organic farm that fronted one of the most beautiful pink sand beaches in the world? We moved there. And for two years, we lived on the land and the sea. I'd haggle daily with the local fishermen for their catchers, adding fish to my otherwise vegan diet because I was so underweight. The farm was abundant with fruit. We grew mixed salads, watercress. I had eggplant, courgettes, carrots and onions. And I purchased bushels, which I found out was a large cardboard box full, of amazing mangoes. 
I swapped homemade bread for tuna. I distilled noni juice. I meditated. I read. I watched only positive movies. I walked the beach with my dogs. And it was one of the most uplifting and amazing times of my life. And I recovered fully. But the challenges continued. Will Polson's words became my mantra. Strong trees do not grow with ease. The stronger the wind, the stronger the trees. That's when it imploded. My father's stroke on my birthday for good measure had preceded the cancer in me. Then after my treatment or during my treatment, the farm was destroyed by two hurricanes. And at that time, after the phone was reconnected, I had a call telling me that my mother had terminal pancreatic cancer. My children had little stability as I spent the best part of those two years in hospital, in America for me, or in the UK for my father and mother. I then discovered that the bedrock, the financial safety I'd sacrificed everything for, worked so hard for, was pretty much gone. Poor investments from a husband trying to hold it together. The marriage didn't last after that. I had to go home with practically nothing. It was a time of intense pain and overwhelm. Not only did I have to freeze what was left of our money, I literally had what I could physically load onto a BA flight out of Nassau with the kids. I then found I was not entitled to any support from UK social services for six months upon my return. So I had to sell my best, most treasured jewelry to support myself and the mother. Now a single mother with no bank assets, two young children, my dear father gifted me his car and he paid for the rental on a small house I found. And just as I watched my mother die from pancreatic cancer, my husband for good measure brought criminal charges after me. Three days after the funeral, I opened my door. There were two police officers. They seized our passports. A bailiff arrived half an hour later and served me with a writ to appear in the High Court of London, faced with charges of abducting my own children from our country of residence. I was reeling. I managed to pick them up after swimming class. I remember sitting by that hot, humid pool, shouts of fun and laughter, feeling utterly bereft, exhausted to my core. I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep, I could barely breathe. That night, I popped out three packets of heavy duty sleeping pills. I sat on the bed, I looked at them scattered across the bedding, thinking how easy it would be to just grab a handful, open a bottle of wine and sink into oblivion to stop the pain. Yet I didn't. I couldn't check out and leave my children or my father. I felt there was love and hope and support somewhere. I had to reconnect with it and I did. I moved to be near my father, we won the court case, and I spent many years making up lost time with him. I became head of marketing and communication for the Leprosy Mission Charity and spent times of pure privilege with some of the poorest and most marginalized people in the world, hearing their stories, seeing their courage, gave me my sense of self back. This period of challenges and upheavals came to a head watching Madonna that night and I had the inner strength to reset my life once more. Wow. I've not heard your story before in that way, Rosalind. Uh, it's, there's a lot to cover. Before we talk about it in more detail, a little note to anyone listening for the first time or anyone who has forgotten. My name is Stefano, I run Puck Creations and I am the regular host of this podcast. If the title Storytelling with Puck hasn't given it away, this podcast is all about stories. We'll share stories, chat about stories and see how stories fit in with the business world too. Of course, we couldn't do any of that without our wonderful guests, so, let's start by properly introducing Rosalind Palmer. Rosalind, we've just had a big part of what's taken you to where you are today, and I'd like to go into that a little deeper. Before we do, tell us more about who you are now. I, I am a, an advanced 
rapid transformational therapist and coach and rapid transformational therapy itself is a hybrid therapy that takes the best of clinical hypnotherapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, NLP and psychotherapy. Um, so it's very powerful and kind of says what it does on the tin. It's pretty rapid and it's pretty transformational. And I trained in that on the inaugural course six years ago and then became a trainer for a while. And I'm an NLP based coach and I deal with, well, like a GP, you're trained to deal with anything really and anybody, but my probably go to client is my former self. I like to refer to her as burnt out Barbara or Bob. And so <laughs> they tend to be high performing or business people or solo or entrepreneurs who are, um, it looks great on the outside. So my passion now is to make their successful or super successful life that looks brilliant on the outside feel just as good on the inside because I know what that mismatch feels like when you don't have, when you're not in alignment with the true. And the story I've just told, which is um, actually a chapter in, in, in a book that I contributed to after writing my own book, is I suppose, you know, if, if Hollywood were to do the, you know, the, the mini series or the, or the one-off, that, that would be the, the kind of the one-off version. But of course, <laughs> Um, my life is many more things than that. But what I'm great at now in terms of the therapy I offer is because I really have walked in a lot of people's shoes, as you can yeah. see just from that small extract, burnt out, near suicidal, bulimic for a while, divorce, redundancy, cancer, you know, I, I these things felt like burdens at the time, but now I see them as gifts because um, it's allowed me to become an incredibly strong and authentic version of myself. And also it means I have huge compassion and empathy for the people I work with. And because of the previous several decades of PR and marketing, I found I was very easily able to talk about it and so I, I did crazy things like go to be interviewed on a radio show and then offered a position as one of the radio <laughs> hosts <laughs> which was like oh okay thank you I, I, yes I'd love that so I have a newspaper column I've got my own book I've contributed to three others I have a radio show I have a podcast and I again see that as incredible synchronicity that I am able to communicate not just my story but through my story often but I'm able to communicate things that to many people seem a bit esoteric or difficult to get hold of and I think one of the gifts of PR is you can take quite complex things and make them yes. simple <laughs> um or that that joke of I'm sorry I wrote you such a long letter I didn't have time to write a short one <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know I'm, I'm like I'm I'm aiming and I and, and I do to, to get that emotional journey and emotional distress and emotional rescue and everything that I do um, as a therapist and a coach also to communicate that through everything I do. So that that's me really. Well, yeah. it's, it's lovely for me and for our listeners to properly meet you. <laughs> and uh, we've dug <laughs> in um, through that uh, chapter. I, I, I'm fascinated by the story and uh, I'm also fascinated by, and I'm sure I'm not going to be the only one, the different emotions um, that I was going through as I was listening to your story. So I can only imagine the emotions that you must have had living your story as you um, uh, uh, over the years. I'd like to revisit the beginning a little, um, not the Madonna part. Um, we'll come back to, <laughs> to that a little bit later, but the beginning of the part where you were outwardly happy. You were outwardly successful. You ran a, an extremely fast-growing, money-making company. And as you say, a lot of the experiences that you had then are helping now. What I'm interested in is, at the time, were there moments, were there periods of your life where you thought, hang on, this isn't right, I don't feel great? Or was it more of an explosion later on that triggered it? I think there were times along the way when I felt like that. And 
I think the very fact that I had psychotherapy in the late 80s, you know, early, early, that was even before I'd launched my PR company. So that, that was in 91, I launched the company. So I think that is telling that even then, um, because I was working in PR, I worked for Lynn Franks, which is what the program Absolutely Fabulous is based on. So that was even more insane. I mean, we could have a whole podcast just about that. <laughs> the next episode, <laughs> we'll have to. <laughs> It was like, you know, the kind of Wolf of Wall Street yeah, yeah. almost. So I, I, I came through the, the late 80s, you know, in that wow. world. Um, and I was a girl who went to a comprehensive school and was a grocer's daughter. So it, it wasn't a world I was, um, I don't know if you're ever born into a world, but it wasn't a world I'd been familiar with, let's put it that way. And I, I can remember getting on a Friday, one of the girls said to me, isn't it lovely getting our wages because it's pocket money for the weekend? And I went, I live on mine. <laughs> I live on mine for a month. <laughs> you know, I pay rent and I buy food and I do everything. She went, oh, how lovely. You know, it's like, you know, these two worlds colliding. And my first husband went to Gordonston and, you know, our very first date, you know, Prince Andrew was there. Wow. So these were very different worlds to the one I'd lived in or grown up in, um, in Nottingham. So even throughout the 80s, and I think, as I say, I think for me, the, the proof points that it wasn't all as good as it probably looked were the illnesses, you know, having a tonsillectomy at 26, shingles, you know, that, so my body was going, oh, hello, <laughs> something's not right here. And my mind was doing it too, clearly, because, you know, I had psychotherapy in the late 80s, I had psychotherapy in the early 90s, I had hypnotherapy in the 90s. I wouldn't have been reaching out for that help had it all been hunky-dory. Um, so to answer your question, I think I remember that moment in the Millennium Stadium is particularly poignant because I, I'd felt that quite a lot before, usually when I was in an aeroplane, funnily enough. You know, when you get that moment of yeah. quiet, if you're, luck, if you're going to somewhere in Europe, particularly from England, and you fly over the Alps, which is just, I never cease to be... It still blows me away too, yeah. It blows you away, doesn't it? And you suddenly look out the window and you just see the top of the Alps and the snow, and, and it just seems so vast it's like a moment when you gain some real weird perspective on life and you and I can remember that moment looking out the aeroplane several several times and just thinking you know like the talking head songs how did I get here <laughs> um so there was definitely moments of it yeah before before it imploded yeah absolutely before it imploded when those moments happened was there, uh, whether or not it was real or in your mind, was there a pressure on you to keep going and to keep forcing yourself to do what you were doing and to keep trying to be what everybody else deems as successful oh, because 100%. you were there and other people yeah. hadn't made it and therefore you should be happy? 100%. And... I, you know, as a therapist now, I'm I'm so tuned into that with people. And there's a social anthropology that says that within our family, we are cast into roles very much like we were in cavemen times to survive. So if you didn't have a role in your tribe, you weren't going to stay there. And and the and the roles, you know, more or less, okay were four roles, which was kind of a lister. I'm going to go out, shoot the arrows. I'm going to provide um, the nurse. I'm going to take care of everybody, the rebel. And they could be good or bad. You know, hey, I have found fire or actually I'm just very <laughs> annoying and I don't want to do it like everybody else says. But, you know, clearly thing, they wouldn't find a new cave or different things if they didn't have that person. And then the sick one, which sounds terrible, but it's like I don't get my needs met unless I'm... And I did not realise, because I have one sister and my, no, my parents, I was the A-lister, you know. I was, you know, the golden-haired girl. I was the first member of my family to ever go to university, get a degree. Um, throughout my childhood, you know, I'd be the brownie guide leader. I was the girl guide representative for Nottingham, you know, not just good enough, you know, to be for your parents. For the whole of Nottingham, for the Queen's Jubilee and Met the Queen, um, I had my own radio show at wow. 15. And of course, probably a lot of people would say, oh, what an annoying person she is. <laughs> you know? but, but I was 
cast into that role and I'm the classic um I think they call it an ambivalent now the extra extroverted mm -hmm. introvert you know so I played that role I was cast into that role I did that role really well but it never truly sat well with me and when I think about the degree I did I did English literature what do you do you spend three years in really rubbish student accommodation reading heavy books like Dostoevsky and you know and and talking about the great issues of the day this is not the degree of an extrovert <laughs> this is the degree of an introverted deep thinker and then I'm suddenly cast you know just because of the way life went and i I originally wanted to be a journalist and fell into that early career of PR. I went for an interview in PR, not even knowing what PR meant, because, you know, we're, we're in the yeah. you know mid 80s. It's like, what is it? Oh, it involves <laughs> writing. Oh, that sounds great. I'd love that. I can write. I'd love to do that. Oh, and talking to journalists. Brilliant. I want to be a journalist. I'm going to write and talk to journalists. What a perfect career. Um, and of course, it you know, wasn't quite that. And then I went into marketing and advertising and that whole world which was great because it's profitable and it was fast moving and it was crazy. And, you know, I've had some amazing experiences like flying on Concord with the Bee Gees and wow. all sorts of madness. But ultimately there was a mismatch because I'd been cast, like I say, into a role I didn't know I'd auditioned for. That's, it's quite profound. And I think it's something that we see privilege and we see, the idea of people, you know, getting to the top as sometimes being privileged and you get there and therefore you're rich and therefore everything you have in your life must be amazing. And there's this, it's probably been emphasized even more with the birth of social media and the Instagrams of the world. And everyone then has this perfect life on the outside that we all see. And then even with people who didn't have anything to start with um, or were struggling to start with, and as you say, like you were a grocer's daughter and then made your way to being at the top, we still see that quite often, I think, as society as, well, that person is now privileged, <laughs> very, uh, very privileged because of, uh, because of the way where you are. And I think often from the outside looking in, it's easy to say, well, they have nothing to worry about. They have, they can't have anything to worry about because they can fix it with money or they can, uh, you know, they can fix it by taking however much time they want away from the world whenever they feel like it. In a sense, my question around that would be those outside perspectives, did they add even more pressure? So nobody can empathize with you. If that makes sense, does it does it ever feel like that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had members of my own family who, you know, came down to London and you know, I've got an eight bedroom house, and it was a bit like, we, we, who is she? We don't know who she is anymore. And, and and it really wasn't because I had become some sort of awful person. <laughs> it, it was just they couldn't relate to it. And I think about that more now, and I think it it just must have been really weird for yeah. them, you know because that was my life and I'm what I'm seeing every day is the struggle to pay the mortgage what I'm seeing every day is oh my god we must keep that account if we lose that account how will I pay the mortgage or how will I keep somebody on I'm going to have to make somebody redundant and I know what that feels like because they've been made redundant a couple mm -hmm. of times but they're looking at the the trappings they're looking at the thing and 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 it's a bit like you know can't relate anymore um it was always fine with my mum and dad they were just super proud of me That's and lovely. you know they're, they're both gone now and so I adored them but you know clearly they, there was a lot of pressure because I was this golden haired girl I was this you know my mum was you know insanely proud of what I'd achieved but it, it didn't really feel like I had an option to, and to, to do stop. what you actually wanted yeah. to do and to go back and yeah I think if I'd have gone home and gone actually I'm going to go and live in a yurt in Devon and do pottery <laughs> I'd be like I'm sorry you know what, what about all that you know and of course what happens is you you up the ante on everything don't you because by that time you've got school fees for the kids mm. you've got the mortgage you've got the nanny you've got you know all these things and you see it over and over again with documentaries on people like Whitney Houston and and recently Britney Spears you you, you become 
the kind of provider to the circus yeah. that is your life. And I'm not saying my life was a circus. It wasn't, you know, it was, it was a lot more measured and stable than that. Their lives have become circuses, but you know, they, they, you know, Whitney Houston, arguably, they, they didn't want the cash cow to, to stop, you know, providing for the entire entourage and the family. And the, the fact that she was incredibly unwell, certainly mentally, you know, was, was sort of glossed over because you know, we, we don't want that to end. And funnily enough, when I came back from the Bahamas and I was, you know, at the absolute bottom in this kind of rented home and with the kids and nothing and facing the court case and everything, I would get the kids to bed at night and then I would go into the bath and I would listen to the local radio on a little kind of transistor radio. And they had a talk show and it was always about nine o'clock at night. Um, and one week it was when Britney Spears had driven with her, her, her yeah, child yeah. on her lap. And, oh, the vitriol. It was unbelievable. It was just so awful. And I rang in and... <laughs> I was in the bath. It was so funny. And I just said, look, I've lived around these people. I've lived in gated communities in the Bahamas and I've, I've had royalty. I, I worked for the royal family. I, I, I did the Duke of Edinburgh's awards with the handover from Edward to, to the Duke of, well, from the Duke of Edinburgh to Edward. Um, and knew Sophie Reese jones as she was. And I'd mixed with loads of celebs, you know, I'd, I'd had that life. And I knew that, you know, cut me and I will bleed. I knew that they were real people having real lives behind all the scenes. So I rang in and said this and they went, oh, we're putting you live on air. And I was like, I'm in the bath. <laughs> I think they were my first words, live on Radio Nottingham, you know, hello and over to our caller who's in the bath. Um, and I made these points. And what was really interesting was the whole tenure of that conversation changed afterwards. I was actually really proud I'd done it because quite a few people rang in afterwards and went, yeah, I suppose she is human, really. It's probably why she's shaved her head and seems to be having a bit of a bad time. And if you've seen the recent documentary about Britney Spears, I have no idea how she's still alive and kept sane. I really don't. <laughs> um, so, yes, I think to answer your question in a very long way, I apologise. <laughs> don't apologise. Please don't apologise. I'm passionately about it. It is even worse in a way, because it's even worse if people think that the gloss and the big house and all the rest of it give you immunity from feeling terrible when somebody just trolled you or that your divorce feels any less painful than somebody else's divorce. And of course, look, it, it is. Don't get me wrong. I, you know, it's lovely being in the Bahamas. <laughs> And, and I've been a single mum in a not very nice suburb of Nottingham. And I was a student in London in really terrible, terrible accommodation where you would carry your, your, your car keys in your hand when you walk down, you know, in a tower block. I lived in a tower block. They're grim existences, some of those, particularly if you don't feel you can ever get out. So I'm, I'm not in any way, I don't want anybody to listen to this and go, I can't believe she's saying that it's all so great. But, you know, as the Meghan and Harry interview show you, as the Princess Diana interview shows you, as all of those things, it's real life behind the curtain. That's it. I, I can't really add more to that because I think you've explained it so well. It, I, I think... What one thing I will add actually is that sometimes what we miss in life when we look from the outside is that we are all connected by one key thing, and that's that we're all human, and so we all have the same challenges. And yes, of course, if you have more money, you have means to do certain things. And as you say, there's no comparison in some ways to the lives that some people have and the actual circumstances. But one thing that we all have are feelings and feelings then can change our whole psychology, the way we think, the way we then act. And money is not an answer to any of that. No. And a lot of people, I mean, Robbie Williams is a brilliant example when he, and actually he's got it all back together again. So he's a perfect, you know, he's a great example of how you can have it, lose yeah. it, have it, you know, or work out what, what it was. And he, he said that when he signed one of his record deals, you know, for like, I don't know how many figures, he, it was one of the most miserable days of his life. And he'd really gained his success to prove to his father, you know, that he was, you know, worthy and could do it. 
but he felt hollow inside. He didn't feel enough. He, it didn't give him the joy, it, you know. So it was that moment of, is this it? You know, Jack Nicholson, is this as good as it gets? You know, I'm here. I've, I've got all the trappings. I've, I've just put a load of money in my bank. And yet I still feel miserable. I still feel empty. I still feel not enough. Because you're, you're absolutely on the money. If you don't deal with how you feel inside, if you think that those trappings will make you feel better of course in some ways they will you know I'm not again it's nuanced again I'm not saying it's not lovely to have a lovely house and a lovely car and all of those things but if you only have them because that in a way you think that I'm here I feel terrible if I was here and had those things I would feel great Oh, I'm here and I still feel yeah. terrible. So what, what extra yeah. material thing do you need to make it enough? I, I can't remember who it was. Exactly. I wish I could remember the name, but somebody who was introduced at one of the Oscar or the BAFTA ceremonies and um, they introduced them as two-time BAFTA winner. And then if I could remember the name, this would be a lot better. Um, <laughs> but then they came onto stage and they said, oh, do you know... The only thing that's going to be better than being the two introduced as the two-time BAFTA winner is when I'm introduced as the three-time BAFTA winner because that will be enough. Perfect. And like it was very sarcastic. <laughs> the, the idea that like, well, what does it matter if I've won two BAFTAs? What does it matter if I've won a number of Oscars, etc.? And of course, it does matter to an extent, but it shouldn't be what makes you. Those things aren't what. That's the issue. It it. It's confusing those things which can be amazing and rewards and lovely and up level your life and give you all the reward for what you've worked for. It's confusing those things with giving you the emotional at oneness and happiness with yourself that maybe you crave because the only person you take with you on every part of your journey yeah. is you. And that's what I tell my story to try and convey. So, you know, we are getting to the hub of it that, you know, I've been rich, I've been poor, <laughs> I've been, you know, I've, I've, I've had money, lost money or not had money. I've, I've come from humble beginnings. I've made it. Um, I've made it in different ways. And, and I know what that journey feels like on the inside. And so that's the key because, you know, Somebody like Richard Branson, I look at him, I don't know him. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm quoting from the outside, which is almost what I'm telling <laughs> you not to do. But, but he does seem like he's pulled it off to me because he seems to have this fantastic, you know, fun, interesting life and be very happy and grounded in his family life and his values seem pretty good and, you know, and, and kind of pull it off. And so, you know, it is possible, but I think it takes work. Yeah, it's interesting though, as you say, I'd love to know if that's true because it I seems like it, um, but maybe he markets himself very well, <laughs> but it does seem like it, I agree. Very good PR. Exactly, exactly. Um, maybe you can get over there and help him in the future. But... <laughs> I'm available, Richard. You can find me out anytime to NECA. I'm, I'm, you know. <laughs> um, I want to dig down though to something that when you did then have those experiences, the really tough experiences. And again, we could have podcasts on each one, if I'm honest with you. When you um, were diagnosed with cancer, when your dad uh, had a stroke, when your mum was diagnosed with cancer, like, these are explosive in anyone's life. They're all explosive. And then losing the money, coming back to the UK... Again, I'd love to dig into all of these deeper, but I think I won't for this podcast. But what I want to find out more about, actually, is what do you think it was that did drive you, and I think you might have a story about this, to yeah. actually get through all of that? Great question. And do you know what? I didn't really understand it until quite recently when I truly had to reflect back so I was asked to contribute to a book called um, Ignite Your Female Leadership. And I immediately went, yeah, hello, yeah, I've been a leader. Um, I'm female. <laughs> <laughs> tick, tick. <laughs> I, I can write. Yeah. And then I really, 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 really struggled. I, I really did. You know, I was like literally having writer's block. It was, it didn't come at all. It was like, what's wrong? What is wrong with this? And I had to really dig deep into what made me 
a leader, if you like. So what made me me? What made me get through? Where did the grit come from? Before Rosalind tells us more about where that grit came from, now might be a good time to remind you that you are listening to episode 15 of the Storytelling with Puck podcast with our guest, Rosalind Palmer. We've already talked about some aspects of Rosalind's roller coaster life. Listening to Madonna that day awakened her to some of the feelings she already had, but getting through so many traumatic moments takes something special. We are about to listen to the story of another traumatic moment of a violent and sexual nature. Please get support if you need it, and stop listening if you feel like it might be too much. As we continue with the episode, we'll discover more about Rosalind's childhood, and we'll hear what she would say to her younger self. Once we've said our goodbyes, we will of course end with a story from Puck Creations. But for now, Rosalind, please tell us more about where you got your grit. This is very relevant to recent events as well that happened, you know, about women and safety as well, the way it starts. So I'd like to say that because um, I do feel passionately that we need to make our streets safe. So it's called Awakening My Leadership DNA. It was the anger that took over, something pure that tapped into a primeval instinct for survival. Now you've ruined my dress, you bastard. I'd chosen my best summer dress. The multicolored flowers suited the sunny June weather. Its gaiety reflected my mood. I was in my hometown to meet important sponsors for the theater production launching that evening. My parents were invited to the after show party. My generous boss has given them front row seats. I took to my job like a duck to water as I loved the theatre. I adored working in St. James's Square in the heart of London. Long hours, awful pay. I loved every minute. So the chance to take one of our most successful London productions, it was a theatrical production company, on a nationwide tour was thrilling. Yet here I was on the cement floor of a multi-storey car park, covered in petrol and grime, fighting for my life at 2.30pm on a midweek afternoon. The man sprang out as I opened my door to go to the pay machine. He was huge and he pushed me down into the passenger seat footwell. As he turned the keys that were still in the ignition, my mind went into overdrive. Movies had taught me that being abducted was not a good thing. You can have the car, I'll just get out, I heard my own detached voice say. You'd better be quick, here's my boyfriend. I raised my crumpled arm to point out of the driver's window. The man spun round to look. I grabbed the ignition key, jabbed it at his eye with a superhuman surge of strength pushed him out he pulled me out with him by my hair I only had one thought I am not going with you he threw me actually I missed a bit out he tried to knock me unconscious with my head on the top of the car but there was a fight he threw me on the petrol smeared and grimy car park floor and that is when the anger kicked in I fought like a wildcat and I escaped when I saw his face on a photo fit on the cover of the Sun newspaper 14 years after the attack, my blood ran cold. There he was, the UK's most prolific serial rapist who abducted his victims, became increasingly violent towards them. I rang 999. Scotland Yard interviewed me and confirmed that I was only one of two victims who'd escaped. I recalled the details so vividly they knew it was him. Yet even before that confirmation, this experience instilled in me a, a belief, I'm a survivor. I have the inner wisdom, the drive, the determination to survive against all odds. The lens of get on with it, push on through, became how I saw the world. I found it empowering. I knew I wasn't invincible, but it brought me through challenges such as breast cancer, financial loss, divorce, redundancy. It awoke within me my leadership DNA. The seeds of that grit and determination were sown when I was born a grocer's daughter. 
My early years were spent living above the shop in a rundown suburb of Nottingham. The dilapidated buildings were later torn down, depriving my parents of their livelihood and us of our home. My enterprising father went on to purchase land where new housing developments were planned and he created a thriving business. But that first shop, oh, it was an Aladdin's cave of food and hardware. Huge apothecary jars were filled with sweets and unknowns. Huge hams would be cooked and sold by the slice. My father and his mother before him prided themselves on their delicatessen products. My grandfather kept pigs and chickens in a huge farmhouse and cured his own meat. To the locals, it was the social services of its day. My parents knew whose husband gambled his wages away. The women heads down to hide blackened eyes would open threadbare purses as tears rolled down their cheeks and my mother would raise a finger to her lips, shushing them and me while passing them wax wrapped packages. I remember the women clutching my mother's hand and those looks exchanged. My parents didn't call themselves leaders. They led by example. The seeds were sown while witnessing this compassion in action, the DNA reinforced. Later, I became a self-employed woman in business and then worked for an international charity working, um, serving the most marginalized people in the world, the leprosy mission. I read no books on leadership, business or marketing. I lived it. Pocket money was earned weighing out 56 pound bags of muddy potatoes into smaller brown paper bags on an upturned bucket in the garage. It was my job to cut huge blocks of cheese with a large wire on a marble box block into small predetermined packs. I hardly need to weigh anything today as I estimate so well and my mental maths is brilliant. My father would create special offers, buy one, get one free, 10% off. He'd create leaflets on a bander machine that I'd smell and then post through every letterbox in the neighborhood. In our living room, we had two huge Indian vases. I still have them in my home today. The vases, cobalt blue with gold paintings of smoky hills, were always stuffed with money as the banks closed before our shop. Every day I saw the physical reciprocity for hard work. I also saw the toll it took on my father. Exhaustion and migraines pretty much every Sunday would force him to bed. He found it hard to delegate. Early seeds were planted for another lesson let go of leadership responsibility to others when you can. Wow. Um, <laughs> it's, firstly, I would like to thank you um, for sharing that story. It's so important that we share these stories. It's so important that people know what other people go through and to know that it's not okay. It really is not okay. Um, it can't be an easy thing to talk about and it can't be an easy thing to read either. What I enjoy is probably the wrong word, but what I enjoyed about the story though was what you were able to learn from it about yourself, mm. but it should never take that. It no. should never take that kind of thing for somebody to learn. <laughs> Um, how are you? Are you okay to talk about this? Yeah, no, I mean, I, I can feel it in my voice, you know, even now. And, you know, heck knows I've done a lot of work on myself. But, you know, it, it is a very, and, and I think for me, what you feel, and I'm sure a lot of people who, it's not quite survivor's guilt, but you kind of think, wow, that could have gone quite a different way. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a, it's a very much a sliding door moment, isn't it, in your life? Um, I was interviewed by the Telegraph recently um, after all the vigils about the streets and I suppose what I've recently taken from it is that that whole attack was dismissed as a carjacking at the time and I was adamant it, I mean you should the state of me and everything and I suppose it was really frustrating that because it wasn't treated maybe with the severity it should have been treated with at the time um, 
and also the police forces weren't really doing joined up you know that one force wasn't talking to another all of the different departments weren't different departments. who knows how many women you know did really you know suffer that maybe it could have been prevented so for me that's why I spoke out about that. Um, you know, I, I think we know that lesson, but I think it's important to keep knowing that lesson. It's interesting. You say we know that lesson. I think some people know that lesson, but I think until it's drummed in enough to the people who count, <laughs> um, who need to yeah. know that lesson. Uh, as you say as well, there's there's the idea that if the police hadn't dismissed it as a carjacking and had actually listened yeah. to you, then potentially things may have been different afterwards. But oh, absolutely. I mean, you know, I watched the whole documentary on the Yorkshire Ripper, you know, not because I'm a morbid person, but, um, you know, part of me is wearing my CDP hat and thinking, wow, how does how does somebody end up like that? But, you know, again, you know, those women were just dismissed, weren't they? You know, yeah. it was like, oh, she's only a prostitute. Um, I mean, how just terrible. So until we value people the leprosy mission really taught me that you know I'm in Africa I'm in India I'm I was standing in an underpass in India like five or six lanes of traffic going above you disgusting really hot really dirty really dusty really noisy really horrible and those people live there they live under the underpass in tarpaulin tents because people with leprosy are the most marginalised of all people, particularly in India. They're even below the untouchables, you know, with the caste system. Yeah, yeah. You know, you've got leprosy. You're not coming anywhere near us. You can't work. They'll drum you out of your village. There was even shocking anti-leprosy legislation in India until a few years ago, and we, we campaigned against it. But standing there with these people who'd never been heard before, never had their story told before. I think that really, that's a Bodicea moment for me. It's like, and the more, the, the older I get, Stefano, the more I kind of feel I do need to speak out about these things. Because it's not right that we just sort of accept them. No, it isn't. And sometimes I feel like we accept these things because it's painful to dig into them it's painful to speak out it's tiring you feel like it's not going to get anywhere and I understand all of that and I also as well think we've got to be very careful uh, you know with with not to expect um especially women to to speak out if it's not right for them at Absolutely. The time also. You know, I, look, look how much I speak and yet you can hear it in my voice even exactly. I find it uncomfortable so and 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 you know for me it was 10 minutes of madness um, and, you know, arguably, you know, I, well, I didn't get abducted, I didn't get raped, but it was still pretty, you know, scary. Um, you know, an ideal as a therapist I, with a lot of, I would say that probably one in every four of my clients has probably been sexually abused, possibly more. Wow. Yeah. That's, uh... <sighs> I, I wish I could say it's a surprising stat. It's not, but it's a painful stat to hear. It's very painful. Yeah. Sorry, I've really, I've really brought the conversation down, haven't I? <laughs> Please don't say sorry. I, 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 the one thing I really would like to emphasize is that you n never have to say sorry for speaking about something like this. Um, okay. And yes, it's a hard conversation to have, but if we don't have these conversations, then how are we ever going to move forward? So please sure. don't ever, ever apologize. <laughs> um but what I what I would like to move slightly onto is the next stage of the story you were telling, which actually chronologically goes backwards, to you being a grocer's daughter. And so one of the things was what you went through that gave you some of that grit. Um, gave you a lot of grit, I imagine. But also it came before that. It came as you were growing up because you had to learn. You had to learn how to live. You had to learn the basics of business. And as you said, leadership, etc. So it was all tied in. Life. It's, you know, there is no separation really. Yeah. Um, and, and what I loved was at the very end of your story, you mentioned that you haven't you haven't done any formal marketing training you haven't done any formal sales etc that all came the leadership training you came 
uh, you had came through living. Um, and, and I felt bad, you know, let, let's talk about another issue very quickly, imposter syndrome. So in the <laughs> 90s, uh, when I had the PR company and we started doing really well, we had a business consultant in. He was great, actually. And he said, you need to employ people who are better than you. <laughs> you know, And it was actually a brilliant thing to say. Mm -hmm. And so off we went and we found somebody with an MBA who'd been like head of brand management for Mars or one of the really big companies. And I had to pay her more than myself. And it was really galling for a while. <laughs> You know, because it was like, they were like, well, you won't attract her on that salary. It was like, well, I have that salary. <laughs> no, 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 she's really good. <laughs> you know, so it was like, oh, great. second you know? yeah. <laughs> so it's true, but actually it was, it was absolutely right for the business, but it, it probably wasn't great for my ego at the time. Um, but I did feel really intimidated, and I actually started looking into doing an MBA. And again, somebody went to me... <laughs> Are you mad? You know, you're you're doing 80 hour weeks and you literally don't get six hours sleep every night and you're really quite, you know, burnt out. And your business is doing really well, but you think you need to get an MBA, you know. And it was this, um, yeah, it, you know, I suddenly was like, well, I've only got a degree. I've got a BA in English literature and I went to a comprehensive school. You know, she'd been to like Oxbridge and 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 I did feel yeah, I, I felt like an imposter. I really did. And I felt quite um, inadequate um, educationally. Um, yeah, so all of these crazy things go on, don't they? They do. What's really interesting about that is there'll be other people listening who have maybe got an MBA or who have got some other um, <laughs> <a> extreme <laughs> degree um, but, but who, who will think, it's weird how imposter syndrome works because they will think I've never lived the life that some yeah. of these other people have. I'm an imposter because I've not been through any of this. Absolutely. Whereas actually experience is different and we all come at things from different angles. And that's actually what makes us all be able to work together and to achieve so much more. If we all did an MBA or if we all had your life experience, then we'd all just go in exactly the same direction. But you're absolutely right. And comparison is the thief of joy, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, that's that's a lot brilliant. Thing. After that, after that pivotal moment within the business, I had two pivotal moments within the business. That and interviewing somebody who came for an interview who was really great. But as she left, I overheard somebody say, Oh, she's brilliant, but Ros will never employ her because she's too tall. And I'm only five foot three. And I used to find really tall women intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd 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 actually, you know, had a an I, I didn't like employing women who towered over me wow. and I hadn't realized it. They'd realized it. It's amazing. Other people sometimes see things that you don't see yourself. Yeah. They tune into it. You, it it's subconscious for you. Mirror held up. Yeah, yeah. And once I realized that I was like, Oh, I'm going to employ very tall women, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so from then on, did you just have only tall not, people? <laughs> not quite. But it is funny how you need those mirrors holding up and, yeah, yeah. and you're right. And actually when we won the PR week award, when my company, did win it in 99 what they cited was the great staff development we had and the diversity of staff we had because at that pivotal point which was probably in the mid 90s I was like right I'm not just going to judge people by their CVs anymore I want to know about the person so we took people from really weird backgrounds that couldn't have probably got into the big PR companies at the time mm -hmm. because they'd have you know a degree in psychology or they which was unheard of back in the day the yeah. PR companies were all of a muchness and they were looking for a kind of a person you know maybe gone to Rodine and the right university and done the right degree and was saying the right things you know I mean that's a massive generalization but we were definitely the maverick agency and we were maverick in our thinking we were maverick in who we employed and I turned what had felt like a weakness into a strength that's brilliant interestingly as well when you talk about being the maverick agency and you don't have to be a rebel and you don't have to you necessarily go completely against the grain but something which i find really interesting about not just marketing companies um but especially marketing companies is when they try and be the same as all of the other marketing companies. oh absolutely it goes against the grain of marketing 
the no. idea of the, the idea is to differentiate yourself, and yet you want to copy all of the other marketing companies. It to me, it blows but my mind. Does everybody do that today? I mean, you know, there's a great saying: if you see the bandwagon, you're too late. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I, and I see, I see advice for therapists on how to market themselves, and a lot of it is really sound. You know, and for me. I have a really successful practice because marketing has come in easy, funnily enough. It literally is in my, you know, DNA. And uh-huh. so I, whereas a lot of therapists are really good at therapy, but they, 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 they have these real blocks about marketing or even money, you know, all these things that really hold them back. And so there's a, a whole cohort of agencies and people who give them advice. And a lot of it is really sound, but a lot of it is exactly the same. Yeah. And it's a bit like, so if you do these five things, if you do these 10 things and you think, yeah, but they're telling everybody else to do those five things or those 10 things, you know, how am I going to have a USP? How am I going to have a point of differentiation? And so, yeah, there is a lot of that that goes on. On the flip side of that, we have customers who come to us and they literally say at the beginning, they say, I've I've seen this on my competitor's website. Can you do, can you do this for me, please? (laughs) No, oh, we refuse. We, 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 <laughs> no, we could not do that for you. Let's find out about you, what makes you, you who you are as a company. When we first started our business um, and we were looking at kind of the advice that everybody was giving, all we heard was that you must niche. You have to niche to be good in marketing. There's a good reason to niche. I understand that for focus, etc. But what we also heard was that niching, especially by sector, would be what makes you stand out. So if you are niching because you are focusing purely on, um, I've written a blog about this, you're focusing Actually, on purely on wooden toys. I think there's 15 to 17 a link old, here. Then that's going to, to the idea of niching. Out. But it isn't. It isn't going to be what makes you stand out because eventually, if you do well at it, somebody else is going to come along and exactly. come into your market as well. What makes you stand out is who you are as a business. Exactly. Yeah. What values do you have? Um, what's your reason for through being the rock? I like to call it the lettering through the rock. Oh, I like that. You know, like you go to Skegness. <laughs> I live in Lincolnshire, so um, <laughs> or wherever you go in Holland. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, we've only been here a few years, so um, so we, we still, we're still discovering. You know, you know the principle, so Brighton or wherever, and you get a stick of rock and it says Brighton all the way down. Yeah. And even if you cut it at any point, it still says Brighton. Still says Brighton yeah. that, that's about your values. That's about the lettering in the rock. And I, I ran an agency based on that we won awards based on that and so I run my business and my life and who I am based on that now it's the lettering through the rock I love that I really love that I'm um I I, I won't steal it exactly because it's yours there you go (laughs) thank you as a gift I appreciate it (laughs) but yeah it's uh it's amazing that that people want to be the same as everyone else and uh, I understand sometimes in life um, that, you know, maybe it's easier to, to live to live a life where you're kind of just fitting in, although we can have whole discussions about that too. But I especially think in business, if you want to be the same as everyone else, you're not going to have a successful business. You need to find... No, more. exactly. And it comes from fear and discomfort. It's like, oh, give me... You know, it, it's like bowling, you know, when you're not very good at bowling and you put the safety bars down the the edge you know it's like give me those safety bars because I feel safer but the trouble is if everybody's got the safety bars you know you're not learning to bowl the ball down the middle and actually yeah, really, exactly. really get good and get the strikes and so I think I think I get that people want reassurance I get that a lot of advice is very sound but you're right if you're just doing exactly the same as everybody else and that came really early in this career I have now because some of the other therapists I trained with or even trained they went off and got some advice and they literally rang me up and said oh we'd just like you to know that you're doing your marketing wrong <laughs> because we went on this course and so and so so and so told us that you know you should uh you know, so there was a big debate. You should not put your prices on your website or you should put your prices on your website or we know whatever else. And and they'd say it like it was fact. And and I'd go, well, thank you. <laughs> thank, you know, thank you for sharing. Um, <laughs> and, and the great, you know, I come, I, I worked at Marketing Solutions, which was the leading marketing agency in England in the late 
um, 80s and then BMP Business Advertising Agency in the early 90s. You know, I've been, you know, agency life. And, and when I had my PR company, I actually did the PR for a lot of the agencies. I was an agency's agency. So yes. you know, there was literally a time when the editor of Marketing Week and Campaign and Marketing said, you know, you're writing half of our publications because, you know, we were we were doing um stories on behalf of so many clients so i do understand but i think the thing about really great marketing is it's about adaptability and it, and it, it and it is it is about trialing testing changing test change test change adapt adapt test change circumstances change change it so the trouble with some of these advices is they do this kind of this is how it is you know okay yeah maybe now you know, next year, no, not in the world we live in. It's so fast moving. But I, I think you're right about that niching. Yeah, I'm I'm the leading toy manufacturer for wooden toys for 10 year olds. Guess what? Somebody's going to undercut you in six months time. <laughs> exactly. They're going to have a better price or they're yeah. going to have a nicer logo yeah. or whatever it is to make yeah. them suddenly become the Yeah, leader. no. So anyway, we digress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. But but no, um, it's been absolutely amazing. I genuinely could talk to you all day. Um, I, 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 I know I often say this a podcast, but I genuinely mean it. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. But I know you have to go. Um, but before you go, I want to ask you one question that you've spoken a lot about your life experience throughout this podcast and there has been a lot in your life experience that has a lot to speak about and I wish we could dig deeper but if a let's say 15 maybe 20 year old Rosalind came up to you today and asked you what advice could you give me absolutely and I I would love to come back sometime because I think one area that I've not really talked about um, is the spiritual side of me, is synchronicity, is that more ethereal, you know, call it gut instinct, call it intuition, because actually a lot of the work I do with my clients is just that because a lot of my clients come to me and they go, you know, I've got this life. It all feels fine. I feel utterly empty and bereft. Is this as good as it gets? How do I get that joy back? How do I get that mojo, that passion back? And in tapping into their very inner core being, often something quite spiritual or synchronistic happens. And that has definitely been part of my life and my story. And I haven't really told it a lot because probably my positioning, my niche, <laughs> if you like, is as being, you know, a therapist, a clinical hypnotherapist, you know, and a rapid transformation therapist, an NLP based coach, you know, somebody who formerly had a business, somebody you can trust. But there is absolutely another side to it. And I'm very keen to talk about that more. And I think that is what I'm going to talk about more in the future. So um, please have me back in some. No, I definitely will. <laughs> I, I really I really do want to talk about that more as well. Um, yeah. If you have more time, I know you. Have. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. So what advice would I give? I did write one of those great letters uh, to my younger self. And this letter was written to my younger 25 year old self okay. and at the time I was working in Dewsbury in a company uh I hated basically <laughs> I, don't mention their name in that case uh, they're not in existence anymore it was I got made redundant at the end of nine very unhappy months but it was a, a a new publishing company set up so it seemed like a really great idea at the time to leave London and and go up to Yorkshire um, and I'd now do a reverse commute back to London. So, um, and I didn't even have a phone back in the day. So I was very alone during the week. And when I got back to London, nearly all my friends had usually gone somewhere else. And so I felt even more alone and it wasn't great. You know, I was 25. So I felt very isolated, very, I felt almost suicidal. Uh, I felt true isolation at that time and I didn't know what to do about it. So this is the letter to her. So dear Roz, <clears throat> I want you to take five minutes, sit down, breathe deeply and remember that you are a wonderful, heartfelt young woman. What seems like a fork in the road now will lead to greater opportunities. 
You have courage in spades full. And you do twice what most people do in half the time. But remember, you are a human being and be kind to yourself. Don't beat yourself up for the choices or feel life is hard and unfair. Don't allow yourself at this time to feel depressed or that life isn't worth living. It is, I promise. You are very sensitive and vulnerable, but you wear such an effective mask that others often see you as impenetrable and totally in control. They even try and pull you down because of it. Know now that daring to show your vulnerability and to be open to others, to stop judging yourself and others by impossible levels of perfectionism will be the greatest and kindest gift you can ever give yourself. Know now that you are more than enough and that your intellect and emotional intelligence will take you further than you can ever imagine. So you don't need to worry about striving for success. The less you try, the more successful you'll be. When you trust your inner intuition and tap into your inner power, you will not just make the right choices, but intuitively take the right action at the right time. Do not let those who are afraid of your light try to dim it. You are a maverick. You see things differently, you do things differently, and that coupled with your great sense of compassion will make the world a better place. You're curious, so remember, questions are the answer. Don't be afraid to ask questions, seek a better path, do not be a lemming and follow the herd to fit in, even if it makes others uncomfortable. Yours is a path to change the world and this will not always be comfortable to you or others. Treat their fear with grace and understanding. Smile, people will always love you for it. Find out what makes you happy and pursue it every day. Feel at ease with this and all that you need is already within you. Enjoy the journey. Even the bumpy roads will give you a new level of wisdom. Know that you do have a spiritual gift and will experience events, insights and visions that others will absolutely try to rubbish. Don't let them. Trust yourself. Learn to let go. It makes skiing, sex and so much more really wonderful. Speaking of which, don't confuse sex for love or see the need for human contact and connection as anything other than sacred and wonderful. Use your body and value your body as you would worship a goddess. Remember, you're more powerful, sexy, physical and sensual than you will ever know. Do not let sexual shaming or guilt diminish you. Sex is like breath itself and vital and wonderful. Know your worth. This is true for finding your future life partner, your work, your friends, and all other connections. For many years, you will be the power behind the throne. Notice now that much of the fame and fortune of those around you has been created by you. If you want to enjoy that or step into the limelight too, then do not feel restricted or not good enough. Do for yourself what you do for others. Pay close attention to your health and finances. Know that to be wealthy, you need a balance, a balance of faith, fitness, friends, family, finance, and forgiveness. And be mindful to keep that balance always. Learn to meditate and be present. It's not your job to make everyone around you happy or kind or fulfilled. That's their journey. You are not a cash cow for others. Earning money and providing for your future family is not your sole responsibility. Do not sacrifice your health or happiness for success. Trust that you know what's right for you. Create great and healthy and nurturing habits. Understand you studied for an English literature degree because you feel things deeply. 
enjoy time alone and have a connection to all that's real and true in this world. Write your own books, share your wisdom sooner perhaps rather than later. It will just flow from you as you tap into something even beyond your present understanding. You're meant to be this messenger and change agent, but you're not supposed to compromise your health and happiness for it. Only connect. Understand that people who need people really are the happiest people of all. We're all in this together. There's so much more I could share But know that you will be more than okay, more than enough. You'll shine and grow and love and be loved and your life will enrich others. Feel that, love it. Oh yes, and have intimacy with yourself. Look into yourself. Intimacy means into me see. I see into you and I'm so excited by it, moved by it, in love with it. Yabba dabba do. Love always. <laughs> Yabba dabba do. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was incredible. And a lesson, not just for your younger self, but I think for lots of younger selves out there, a beautiful lesson, a heartfelt lesson, and something that I think lots of people will appreciate being able to think about and maybe work out whether or not they're on the right trajectory for where they want to be right now off the back of it. So thank you so much for sharing it. I should also add that it was beautifully written. It's clear that you were all right, that the prose was wonderful. Thank you. Well, I'm going to write a novel next year. Oh, wow. Yes, my first novel. That's a whole other podcast again. Watch this this space. I'm I'm watching closely. I am writing a novel. I'm writing a novel. I've got the plot. I've got everything. I'm writing it next year. How exciting. I love that as well because you're accountable. It's out there. Yes, exactly. And a TED Talk. I'm going to do a TED Talk and write a novel. So there you go. Are you going to breathe at any point or is it... I want to breathe well. You know, I live, I live, I live in the country. I live in a small holding. For my birthday, I was bought six sheep. You know, I, oh, I, wow. I do walk my talk. I talk about balance, and yeah, yeah. yeah I don't always get it right, but I, I, I that weeble can self write really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. So. Other people are going to want to find more balance and other people are going to need support with it. So if they want that, how can they find you? Well, the easiest way would be my website, which is www.rosalindpalmer.com. And I'm sure you'll have the spelling. Um, I'm pretty much on social media. If you Google Rosalind Palmer, I I usually pop up. I've obviously got my podcast, Monkey Business, which I'd love people to listen to. I'm on Twitter, but yeah, the website is probably the easiest way. There's lots of free things on there, free hypnosis downloads and workbooks. Cause I, you know, I have to have that background in charity and, and, and supporting people. And I know not everybody can afford therapy. So I try to make some stuff readily available or there's very mm-hmm. easy ways to get in touch with me. That's brilliant. I love it. Um, and I have loved this conversation so much. Um, I uh, Genuinely, we, we're going to do this again um, when we get the next <laughs> series. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about spiritual things and potentially yeah. your novel. <laughs> um, I so. love that. I love that. Spiritual things, my novel. I can tell you all about sheep. I will have had my first lambing season by then. Wow. So. <laughs> Yes, yes. This is exciting. We'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll we'll use this conversation as the trailer for it as well. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much for joining me um, and for spending so much time. I know we went a little bit over what we had agreed. Yes, so thank you. I, I, I we could talk it. all day, but I'm sure people have things they need to do. So thank you so much for having me. I really, I've loved it. Thank it's you. a pleasure. And as always, we will finish the podcast with a story from Park Creations. When you left us, I was strong. I was young. But I was strong. I was immature. But I was strong. I was the baby. But I was strong. I was just 18. But I was strong. I was by your side. But I was strong. I was without my guide. 
but I was strong. I was hurt, but I was strong. I was broken, but I was strong. I was torn apart, but I was strong. I was a fool, for I wasn't strong. You were my strength, and my strength was gone. It grew again until he left us too. I am not strong, but I can be again because of the strength that was you. You've just been listening to the Storytelling with Puck podcast. We'll be back very soon, so make sure you subscribe and catch up on any of the episodes you've missed.